We're going to go through Kepler's three laws, which states that orbits are elliptical, orbits possess an equal area phenomena, and planets move faster when it's closer to the Sun. Our experimental model is based on Einstein's space-time continuum theory. Massive objects like the Sun can cause the space-time continuum to warp drastically, which causes planets around the Sun, such as the Earth or Mars, to orbit, allowed by the curvature of space-time. To simulate the fabric of space-time, we use a bucket pulled over with a piece of cloth and some metal balls. And we use a large stick to warp the fabric such that it simulates the gravity of something massive like the sun. Kepler's first law states that the orbit of a planet about the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. In this experiment, the metal balls represent planets while the stick represents the sun. As you can see, the balls travel in an oval-shaped fashion around the stick Moreover, the balls tend to travel faster when it is nearer to the stick and slower when it's further away from the stick. This shows that indeed the planets orbit in an ellipse about the sun. The planets travel faster when they are in perihelion, which is when they are closer to the sun, and travel slower at aphelion, which is when they are furthest from the sun. Kepler only came to this conclusion after figuring out his second law which says that if you draw a line from the Sun to Mars, for example, and wait a fixed amount of time for, let's say, 30 days, one month, that line will sweep out a certain area as Mars moves along its orbit. What Kepler noticed was that its area is exactly the same no matter where in the orbit. So if Mars is approaching perihelion, it's traveling faster than it is at aphelion, the point that's farthest away. In the perihelion, closest to the Sun, the line connecting Mars to the Sun is very short, but because the planet is moving so fast, it covers a lot of distance. It is in aphelion, uh, the point where it's furthest from the Sun. The line segment is much longer, but Mars also moves very slowly. In the way the area swept out is fixed. The second law, it turns out, it is also a consequence of the conservation of angular momentum, which was not a concept known to Kepler in the 17th century. Angular momentum is a measure of the amount of rotational motion in a body or system of bodies like Mars and the Sun. And in the absence of outside forces, it's a fixed quantity. This implies a trade-off between the distance at which Mars orbits and its velocity like Kepler noticed. The inverse relationship that Kepler proposed between distance from the Sun and the orbital velocity could explain the puzzling observations of Mars movements, but only if the orbit is an ellipse. A circular orbit would mean no change in distance from the Sun with time, and thus the velocity would be constant as well. Kepler's third law of planetary motion, the law of harmony, states that the square of sidereal periods of revolution of the planet are directly proportional to the cubes of their mean distance from the Sun. So what it really means is that the sidereal period, or the time taken for the planet to orbit one round around the Sun, corresponds to the distance of the planet from the Sun. The red over represents the path where the planet will take to go one revolution around the Sun. And the time taken for the planet to do so is represented by the capital letter T, which represents the sidereal period. We can also see a pink double-headed arrow from the Sun to the planet, which is represented by capital letter R, and is the mean distance of the planet from the Sun. Below the diagram shows the relationship between sidereal period and the distance mathematically. So how do we exactly derive this equation? Interestingly, through this proving process, we can also prove another theory, which we will take a look about it later. So how is the sidereal period directly proportional to the distance of the planet from the Sun? At outer space, we can say that the force of gravity is equal to the centripetal force, Fg equals to Fc. The formula for the force of gravity is given by G, which represents the gravitational force multiplied by the mass of two objects, and in this case, is the mass of the Sun and the mass of the Earth, and is divided by the square of mean distance, which is equal to the centripetal force. And if you recall back, to the topic on uniform circular motion, centripetal force is given by mv squared divided by r. 
What the next step is about is basically removing the common factors and that's how we get G multiplied by the mass of the sun divided by R equals to V squared. V is the velocity of the planet orbiting around the Earth and velocity is defined by the rate of change of displacement. And since the planet is orbiting around the sun in a circular motion, we can assume that the displacement of the planet orbiting around the sun is a circle which is the circumference of the circle 2 pi r divided by t and we can replace the time with the sidereal period of the planet to orbit one revolution around the sun. Continuing the equation by cancelling the common factor and by making t the subject, we will get t squared equals to 4 pi squared r cubed divided by g times mass of the sun. And this equation is shown on the right hand side. Using the exact same t squared equation, but let's compare two different planets. We will get t2 square divided by t1 square, which simply represents the sidereal period of two different planets, equals to r2 cubed divided by r1 cubed, which is the mean distance of these two different planets from the Sun. We can also prove that the velocity of the planet at which the planet is orbiting is inversely proportional to the distance of the planet from the Sun. Here's how we prove it. Using the same equation, t squared equals to r cubed. Sorry about the mistake there, it's supposed to be t. And we can replace t with 2 pi r divided by v and square the whole thing. Sorry about another mistake there. But how do I get this? Remember that I talked about v equals to 2 pi r divided by sidereal period t at the previous slide. But in this case, we make t the subject. That's how we get 2 pi r divided by v. After manipulating, by bringing r all to one side and by cancelling 4 pi square, we will get 1 over r equals to v square. And the reason for me to cancel out 4 pi square is because 4 pi square represents just a constant number. And finally, making v the subject, we will get v equals to square root of 1 over r. Therefore, this equation proves to us that the velocity of the planet is in fact inversely proportional to the distance of the planet from the sun. Two metal balls will be seen orbiting or rotating around the sun. And these two metal balls simply represent two different planets. While the two metal ball is orbiting around the sun, we can see that the metal ball that is nearer to the sun moves at a higher velocity than the metal ball that is further away from the sun. This shows and proves to us that the velocity of the metal ball which is orbiting around the sun is inversely proportional to the mean distance of the metal ball from the sun which is the equation V equals to square root 1 over R. One may ponder if a satellite would orbit around the Earth faster than it would orbit around the Moon. The Earth actually has a larger gravitational field strength, simply because it has more mass. When the Earth has a larger gravitational field strength, that means the terminal velocity of the satellite when it's sent to orbit would be much greater, and therefore the orbital speed would be greater. It is actually related to the gravitational field strength as well as the radius of the satellite from its origin, which is the center of the Earth. The orbital speed relationship can be shown as v orbit equals to the square root of g times the mass of the object which is the Earth or the Moon divided by the radius. g is a gravitational constant and g would relate with the mass to form the gravitational pull as we all are very familiar with. So, Assuming that the satellite orbits around these two planets at the same radius of a thousand kilometers, which is one million meters, the velocity of orbit around the Earth would be equal to the square root of g, which is your constant, times the mass of the Earth, which is 5.972 times standard power of 24, divided by one million meters. So the velocity of an orbit around the Earth would be around 19,958 meters per second. Now when we compare the velocity of orbit around the moon where the mass changes to 7.348 times 10 to the power of 22 kilograms the velocity of orbit around the moon would be 2214 meters per second the satellite on earth would actually orbit faster given both the same orbit radius over 1000 kilometers 
we can demonstrate that a satellite around the Earth would orbit faster using Einstein's space-time continuum theory. To roughly simulate what it would be like for a gravitational pull on the moon, we use a stick and press it lightly on the fabric. This creates a distortion in space-time or what would be space-time. So when we spin the metal ball around, think of it as like the satellite orbiting around the moon. On this second setup, we do the same thing except that the stick is now pushing harder onto the fabric which simulates a greater distortion of gravitational field which also means a larger mass which is Earth. As we spin the metal ball around, we can see it actually orbits faster than what it would be like on the previous setup. Comparing the two setups, you can see that the satellite orbiting around the moon would be orbiting slower than the satellite orbiting around the Earth. In conclusion, the metal ball experiment has been done to define and explain the three laws of Kepler and to find the difference between the orbital motion of a satellite around the moon as compared to around the Earth. All three laws are linked together and provide an explanation as to how the orbital motion of planets work with the Sun as a main focus. Without the laws, it would be difficult to understand the motion of planets. The formulas also help to understand the speed of the orbit of planets that differ depending on their distance from the Sun. Kepler's three laws has been used as a foundation for the study of astronomy. The usefulness of Kepler's laws extends to the motions of natural and artificial satellites as well as to stellar systems and extrasolar planets. However, as formulated by Kepler, the laws do not take into account the gravitational interactions of various planets on each other. The general problem of accurately predicting the motions of more than two bodies under the mutual attractions is quite complicated. I hope now you can have a better understanding of Kepler's three laws of planetary motion.